Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Talks at Google talk on electric vehicles, electric and plug-in vehicles. Um, I'm pleased to welcome, uh, when I messed her, you name you correctly, Gina Copeland Newfield. She directs the Sierra Club's Environmental Vehicle, Electric Vehicles Initiative, which works on the national and state levels to advocate for electric vehicle consumer initiatives and educates the media, policymakers, and the public about the benefits of plug-in vehicles. Brian Kelly is the co-founder of Ironwood Pharmaceuticals and has several and has served as the senior vice president of preclinical research and development since 2010. Both of these people are members of the Sierra Club. Both of them own plug-in vehicles, and I'd like you to uh, say good morning to them, and we'll get a, we'll get going with the talk. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. I use Google products all the time, so thank you so much for making my life so much easier. Um, and I happen to live right here in Cambridge, uh, and as Kurt said, uh, work for the Sierra Club, which is headquartered in California, just like Google is, um, but I happen to work here. Um, and uh, also, as Kurt said, I'm a, I'm a proud driver of a plug-in vehicle. Um, so as you may know, the Sierra Club is the oldest and largest grassroots environmental organization in the country. We were founded in the late 1800s by John Muir. Um, we have 2.4 million members and supporters and chapters in all 50 states. We work on a range of different environmental issues, including wilderness protection um, and a range of campaigns that are confronting climate change. Oil is one of the most serious threats that we face. Uh, oil consumption constitutes about 40% of US climate emissions. Um, and as we all know, uh, climate emissions are leading to some pretty serious problems in terms of increased storms, droughts, fires, uh, extreme weather, floods, et cetera. So um, I don't know about you, but you know, I, I, these kinds of things do keep me up a little bit at night when I think about my children and future grandchildren. Um, climate change is, is a clear and present danger that we're we're, uh, we're facing, and so oil is a big part of that. Um, we also know that we're spending between a quarter and a half a billion dollars every day to pay for foreign oil, often sending money to countries that are not necessarily friendly to U.S. policies. Um, and we also know that um, there are examples like during the height of the fighting in Afghanistan, uh, we heard from the Secretary of the Navy that out of every 24 fuel convoys that were being guarded um, by U.S. soldiers, one Marine or soldier was getting injured or killed uh, for every 24 of these fuel convoys. So that's a pretty heavy price that we're paying for oil. Fortunately, there are alternatives to oil. Um, so we can get around, uh, we can uh, move without having to use oil. So for those of you who bike to work, maybe not on a freezing day like today, but may maybe, um, maybe there were some brave people out there, or walk to work or took, oh good, a brave person in the audience, uh, or took public transit, those are clearly the cleanest ways to get around. But we know that millions of people in this country and around the world will continue to drive. So we need to find cleaner ways uh, to get around in our cars without having to rely on any oil or as much oil. Um, so I love this graphic um, that really makes it tangible. You know, you, you think about uh, the BP Gulf oil disaster that happened a few years ago, um, and you think about all the oil that went into the Gulf of Mexico, and if we had a, a million electric vehicles on the road, um, that would be saving the same amount of oil. Um, so how many people in the audience saw the State of the Union address last night? Excellent. Some fellow policy nerds like me who love that sort of thing. Uh, so this is a quote from President Obama's uh, State of the Union address four years ago when he said, we can break our dependence on oil and become the first country to have one million electric vehicles on the road in 2015. Now, it is 2014, it's, or 2015, it is four years later. Now, will we have one million electric vehicles on US roads by the end of this year? No, we will not, unfortunately. Uh, so we will not meet this goal. Um, 
but we will have somewhere around 400,000 electric vehicles on the road by the end of the year, and we think we'll hit that 1 million mark around 2018. So EVs, or electric vehicles, are gaining market share faster than hybrids gained market share when they first hit the market about 15 years ago. So that's encouraging. The Obama administration has definitely invested in electric vehicles through the Department of Energy's research, through grants and programs that are supporting public charging stations around the country, um, and through the federal tax credit. If you bought an electric vehicle, um, you would get somewhere between 2,500 and 7,500 in a federal tax break, which is certainly um, nothing to, uh, to sneeze at in terms of an incentive. Um, so we're very fortunate to have an administration that's really uh, supportive of this issue. So now is an exciting time. Uh, four years ago when President Obama gave that speech, there were almost no electric vehicles on the road now there are more than a quarter million and there are about 20 models that are available. Not all of these models are available in Massachusetts, but a lot of them are. So there's the BMW i3, there's the plug-in Prius, there's the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Volt, the Tesla Model S, uh, the, all the different Ford models, the Ford Fusion, the Ford C-Max. So there are a lot of great options out there. Raise your hand if you've driven in an electric vehicle before. OK, fantastic. Raise your hand if you actually own one or drive one yourself. Great. Oh, good. A couple examples. So if you've been in one before, you know these are really fun cars. Uh, they're quiet. They're fast. They're very technologically advanced. Um, they are easier and cheaper to maintain than a conventional vehicle because there are fewer mo moving parts involved. Um, and they're just really fun to drive. Um, we talk in the electric vehicles world a lot about getting butts in seats uh, because People, so many people out there just don't realize that they're available or they think they're uh, this futuristic thing um, that aren't accessible to real normal people. Uh, but once you get inside one and you drive it or you ride in one, you, you know that this is, it's here, it's available now, and it's a lot of fun to drive. They don't necessarily work for everybody's lifestyle, right? So if you live in an apartment building where you don't have any access to parking or a driveway or a garage where you could plug the car in, it's going to be challenging to have an electric car. Now, if you have a place to plug it in at work or around town and that's convenient for you, great, that could work out. Um, but for some people, they're just not going to work. But the Union of Concerned Scientists and Consumers Union did a survey a year or so ago, and they found that almost half of Americans actually could make an electric vehicle work for their lifestyle. Um, so more people than, than one might think could be ready for an electric car as their next car. So um, I'll list some of the, just a few examples of the, some of the things that Sierra Club is doing to advance electric vehicles. Um, as I said, we're working on this issue because we see oil and climate change um, as really important issues to address and electric vehicles as one key way to address those problems. Um, so we're doing a few things. Um, so one is public education. So we have public events. Um, we've been having National Drive Electric Week. These are opportunities to have electric vehicle promotion events all around the country. So last year we had National Drive Electric Week in September where we had EV promotion events in 150 cities around the country. We got 90,000 or so people to attend, about 200 media hits. So it was just a really good way to educate the masses, uh, or at least some segment of the masses, about electric cars. Um, we do blogging and media outreach. We have a website. Uh, we also do policy advocacy. So I mentioned the federal tax credit, which is helpful, but it's also helpful to have state incentives. Um, so for example, state rebates that are on top of the federal tax credit. And I'll mention the Massachusetts one in a few minutes. Um, Carpooling access. If you live in California, you know that those carpooling stickers are like gold. There is literally a black market for these stickers because people are so desperate to get out of traffic um, and the hours and hours that they spend in traffic. So if you can have that carpooling sticker, even if you're the only one driving as an electric vehicle driver, that's like gold. So having those kinds of carpooling access in other states that is really helpful as well. Um, a waiver on 
parking registration or emissions tests, these kinds of small things we found can make a difference. So getting more of them in place in more states like Massachusetts is definitely going to help accelerate the electric vehicles market. In fact, who knows the number one state right now uh, per capita for electric vehicle sales? So I'll give you a hint. It is not California and it is not Massachusetts. It is Georgia. And the reason it is Georgia is because there is a really generous uh, credit for driving an electric car in Georgia. Uh, there's a significant discount for driving an electric car there um, because there's this incentive in place. And so these incentives definitely make a difference. So just to give you a little sense of the scale of how fast we need to ramp up demand, we hired a consulting firm to help us evaluate you know, how we can make the biggest impact and how fast we need to accelerate this market. And what they helped us understand is that by the year 2025, we're expecting to have about 4 million electric cars on the road. Now think about the fact that we have about 250 million cars registered in this country, uh, cars and, and light trucks. Um, so that's still a very small sliver of the vehicle market. Now with an aggressive campaign um, that's successful, we think we can bump that up to somewhere between 5 and 7 million electric vehicles by 2025. What we think we need to, where we think we need to be by 2025 to meet our climate goals is more like 10 million EVs on the road by 2025. So we really need to redouble our efforts and find other stakeholders, other NGOs, other companies, government agencies that we can partner with to really focus on accelerating this market. Um, so I won't get too much into the weeds in terms of the policies that we're promoting. We can get back to that during the Q&A session if folks are interested in. But see, these are some of the key strategies that we think are important. Public awareness, which I mentioned, the consumer incentives, um, workplace charging. The Department of Energy has a program called the EV Everywhere Workplace Charging Challenge, which is a mouthful. Um, and this is a program that's working to recruit about 500 major businesses around the US to join the program, install charging stations at workplaces, and get more employees excited about electric cars. They did a survey and found that if somebody has access to electric vehicle charging at work, they are 20 times more likely to drive an electric car than the average person. So clearly, these workplace charging programs make a difference. Google is a member of this workplace charging program, which is fantastic. My understanding is that there are lots of EV chargers in California at Google offices. Um, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think Google has installed any uh, here in Cambridge. I know there are a few charging stations around here, but not necessarily installed by Google. Somebody in the audience is saying zero, uh, which means that there is a need for more charging stations in the area. Um, so if anyone is actually interested in working with Google to get more charging stations installed around here, I would be happy to partner with you to connect with the right folks uh, in your California offices and see if we can make that happen. Um, public charging infrastructure. Most people will charge at home overnight which is actually good for the grid too, right? Because most people are using electricity um, when they're awake. Um, and so if we can be shifting some of the load, the electricity load to the night, that actually makes everything a little bit more efficient. So that's a good thing, but it is nice to have access to public charging infrastructure. So if you're you know, uh, taking a longer trip and you want access to charging infrastructure along the way, that's helpful. If you're gonna be stopping at a place to shop for an hour or so and want to top off, it's nice to be able to have a charging station. So places like IKEA are installing charging stations, which is great. Um, and then utility programs. If you think about um, the fact that right now, the vast majority of the market share for the fuel for our vehicles goes to companies like ExxonMobil and Shell. Um, and if we can shift some of that market share to domestic, utility companies, um, that could be a really great opportunity for these utility companies to take some of that market share. And some utility companies are starting to figure that out, that this is a great opportunity for them. Um, but we need more of them to, to do the math and figure it out and also figure out how to incentivize electric vehicles through things like cheaper electricity rates 
for, elect for the electric vehicle drivers or cheaper nighttime rates, which is, again, the time when most people will charge their electric vehicles. So I encourage everybody to check out our website, which is www.sierraclub.org slash evguide. If you go there, you can click on just about any electric vehicle which is on the market. We're actually working to update it. There are a few new models that we haven't gotten up there yet, but we're working on it. Um, you click on the car. You find out some information about the car. And then it gets interactive. You put in your zip code. And it tells you things like how much money you're saving in uh, gasoline versus electricity costs for fueling your vehicle, how much gasoline you're avoiding, how much oil you're not using and consuming, um, how much you're saving in emissions, right? So we've done the math and figured out that even with the emissions associated with the electricity used to charge your vehicle, your electric vehicle is still going to be much cleaner than a conventional vehicle. Um, you've probably heard people say, oh, electric cars aren't so clean. They're just coal cars because we're using fossil fuels to charge them. Raise your hand if you've heard people say that. Yeah, pretty much everybody has heard that. I hear it every day from Sierra Club supporters who are understandably concerned about coal and natural gas and fossil fuels. That's great. We want people concerned about these issues. but. Um, Rest assured, we've done the math and figured out that even factoring in the emissions associated with charging electric vehicles, they are still significantly cleaner than conventional vehicles. And in a region like New England, that is especially true because um, our reliance on the dirtiest form of electricity, coal, um, is actually pretty low compared to other parts of the country. Um, so in Massachusetts, if you are charging your electric vehicle, um, let's say it's a fully electric vehicle, it's going to be about 60 to 70 percent cleaner in terms of carbon emissions than a conventional vehicle, the average conventional vehicle that you would buy today. Um, so that's pretty significant and it's pretty interesting. So if you go to this website, you can find out information like that. We also have a quiz. It's a really short online quiz that helps you figure out which EV might be best for you based on a variety of factors. So check out the website. Um, and now let me tell you a little bit about some interesting opportunities in Massachusetts. So I serve on the governor's EV task force in Massachusetts, which has um, started to put in place some exciting programs and incentives that make electric vehicles more appealing uh, in Massachusetts. And the most exciting part of that is a rebate. So that means if you lease or purchase an electric vehicle in Massachusetts, you literally get a check in the mail for anywhere between $1,500 to $2,500, depending on the size of the battery of your vehicle. Um, so it's a great opportunity. Our funding source for that program, uh, right now it's a pilot program, it looks like it may run out in the next couple months. So I would say if you're thinking of buying or leasing a car in the next few months, um, and you're thinking about electric, now's a great time to do it before that funding runs out. We're going to be working to get that funding source renewed, but there may be a gap period. So I'd encourage you to um, move faster than slower. Um, and here's the website where you can find out information about this program here in Massachusetts. So it's uh, mor-ev. Org. Oh, what a coincidence. I have a picture here of Brian, who's going to be the next speaker here. Um, so as you've probably gathered, people who drive electric cars, they love their cars. They become evangelists. Sorry for the pun. Um, and uh, I've had the good fortune of meeting Brian, who's a Sierra Club supporter and member and EV driver. Um, and have, I've had the fortune of meeting uh, lots and lots and lots of very excited, enthusiastic electric car drivers around the country. And since Brian is based right here, um, we thought uh, it would be great if he came up and shared a little bit about his experience with his Nissan Leaf. So why, don't, why doesn't Brian come up, talk a little bit about his experience, and then both of us can do Q&A after that. So thanks very much, uh, and good morning. And I, I own an EV because uh, I met Gina, actually, at, at another event that we were at. And it happened to be at that perfect time uh, when I was considering what we were going to do with the Prius that was uh, at the end of its life and the fact that we needed another car. So the timing was uh, absolutely perfect. And uh, I came here today because uh, I think that early adopters of technology play an important role. 
uh, and there are some of you who are already driving electric vehicles, which is awesome. Uh, and I'm assuming that the rest of you are here because you're uh, at least somewhat interested. And so I think it's an opportunity for, for those of us who own uh, to uh, share our experiences and answer questions that people may have uh, so that there might be some other folks who decide to adopt. So actually, I don't have a lot of prepared statements. I think really, uh, ultimately, the role is going to be to answer questions that people have. But just briefly, I'll tell you about, uh, about my experience so far. So we bought our Nissan LEAF in, uh, in June of this year. I did a little bit of uh, analytics uh, before I came here today just to kind of take a look at uh, average energy consumption and other things that we were doing to kind of think about uh, what the cost impact for us has been and how that matched up to, to what I would expect to have seen. So um, before I go into that, what I, what I will tell you is uh, we've been really delighted with the car. The car gets most of its use uh, from my wife, actually, who uh, commutes up to Salem every day from Arlington, Mass. So uh, she drives up there every day. It's about a 29-mile one-way trip. She comes back down, uh, so it's a 58-mile round trip, and there's still uh, miles left on the charge uh, to get around and run some other errands every day. So uh, we have yet to, what's called turtling the car, which is uh, totally running out of energy and be stuck on the side of the road. We haven't turtled once. Uh, you definitely, as an experience, you, know, you always start out thinking, how much charge do I have? And I want to make sure that I don't uh, use it up. So, uh, so there's, you're paying you're a little more attention than you would if you're driving a, a gas-powered vehicle where you can always find a gas station and get some gas. So. Um, so that's definitely there, but you get used to it very quickly. Um, I, I would say that the surprise that I had is I'm not really a car person in the sense that uh, I'm not all that interested in buying high performance vehicles. I've never really had, I drove a, uh, that Prius that I told you before that, we drove uh, you know, Honda Civics my entire driving career. And uh, I will tell you, this uh, Leaf is really, really fun to drive. Even as somebody who doesn't care about those things, it's, uh, it's incredibly zippy. Uh, in traffic, it's really fun to kind of be able to weave in and out of things. It's small, high performance. Uh, that low center of gravity makes you feel like when you're going around turns that it really just turns, it takes those turns really nicely. So it's actually been really fun to drive. And we have four drivers in our house, and we all fight for the leaf, basically, whenever uh, somebody wants to go out on errands. So, so it's a really fun car to drive. Uh, we looked at some other ones, too, uh, at the time. And for us, uh, again, family of five, uh, it really does, and I put that in my bio that was here. You know, we can fit our entire family and our dog, who's a 40-pound uh, mutt, down in the bay and still feel like, you know, we're, we're packed in there, but it's not, it's not ridiculous. We've even done uh, some trips that way. So it's a great, I would say, for us, second car because we do uh, take longer trips as a family, uh, and that obviously, w we get an 80-mile range in the summertime. So the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, as we've headed into winter and it's colder, both uh, the performance of the battery goes down and uh, you're using heat. Uh, and to, which generates more draw on the, on the system. And so uh, we're averaging sort of around more like 60 to 65 miles on the charge in the wintertime uh, that's been. For us, in terms of uh, impact on the house, in, in terms of energy usage, it adds about 250 kilowatt hours uh, per month. So you probably know how much energy you're using at your own home. Uh, we've added on average 250 kilowatt hours on top of that, which is interesting because I also know the mileage that we're getting uh, and uh, I, I have now figured out that basically about 80% of the energy that we're using to power our car is coming from what I'm doing by plugging in at our house. And we're getting about 20% out at charging stations that are out and around, none of which we pay for. So uh, I know that the system pays for it ultimately. Uh, but the charging stations at, uh, at work or in communities that we're parking at that are essentially free to us, they're all charge point uh, systems. I've yet to be charged for any one of my charging events. So I'm getting about 20% of that basically without uh, out of pocket. So. Uh, I think the other thing that I would say is um, we, in contrast uh, to Gina, are not able to put solar on our roof. Uh, that would have been a really nice thing for us to do to get to the notion that we would be completely uh, powering our car with uh, solar energy. There are options, uh, and the one that I did for a little while was the NSTAR Green, where you basically pay a premium on top of your... Uh, of your regular electric bill. Maybe some of you are doing that too. Uh, basically what you're doing at that point is uh, it's not as if you're buying green energy directly. You're subsidizing or creating a market for uh, energy that is generated in, in more renewable ways. Um, there's another program that we're actually using now through Mass Energy uh, that is less expensive than NSTAR Green uh, for us. And so it's basically we're paying four cents more per kilowatt hour, uh, but all of that is uh, going directly to uh, pay for wind generated energy in this particular case. You can actually pay two cents per kilowatt hour and get renewable sources that are uh, bioreactor, uh, hydroelectric, local, and wind, but we chose a wind all option uh, and feel pretty good about that right now. So, um, so all in all, I would say it's been a really great experience. Um, it's a fun community. So uh, Jeannie pointed out we, we, we uh, met earlier. We uh, met again at the, uh, at the climate change march. 
but I'm meeting my neighbors now that, uh, that are starting to drive uh, Leafs and a BMW i3 showed up. And a little funny story, actually I experienced it this morning, but I've experienced it other times over where I work, which is just over here on Binney Street, which is when I first started driving this car in June, there was one electric plug-in Prius uh, and always a second open spot uh, for charging. So whenever I drove to work, which wasn't all that often, but when I did, it was like this great spot on the first level of the parking garage and I could always get it. And then right after Christmas time, I started coming in uh, and there was this BMW i3 that was parked in that second spot. And it was like, ah, you know, I can't believe it. Now there's three cars in this garage that are looking for electricity. So, uh, but the funny part was I met this person and they live a block and a half away from me. Uh, and we had this great conversation about our experiences with the vehicles. Again, that sort of early adopter conversations that started. And just today uh, I drove the car in because I thought maybe we could uh, take some test drives, get some butts and seats if people wanted to do it. And so we look for parking over here and there are four charging stations over here at the garage on the west side. And uh, there were four different uh, electric vehicles that were parked in each of those spots, which is fantastic. So I love that charging stations are starting to be taken up, even at the same time as I hate it right now. I'd love to see us expand the number of charging stations locally so we can get more people to drive in. So anyway, so uh, our experience has been overall incredibly positive. I really have nothing to say. It, it's absolutely true about the maintenance side. There's no checking oil. There's no worry. Like, we get our tires rotated. Uh, we put 1,000 miles a month in the car, which is exactly what we were doing with our Prius. And it's been great. So I think with that, we'll take questions and... Yeah, let's do some Q&A. And I'm sure there are other people with experience that can share insights too. Great. Can I start for just a second? Yeah, Kurt. Yeah, Google here, we love metrics. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about actual costs, what the federal rebates are, um, how that works, and, uh, and, and what the actual... You mentioned that 250 kilowatt hours, how does yeah. it work out in actual dollars? Yeah, great. I can do that one first, which is, uh, for everybody, your bill may be a little bit different. I'm paying about uh, 13 cents a kilowatt hour, so you can do the math on that one. It's 30 bucks or so uh, a month to get 1,000 miles. So, And I, I, that's the other thing I wanted to say. So that was replacing the car that was getting 45 miles to the gallon, too, right? So, so for me, I need to tell you, it was not a total straight-up cost equation about I want to save money relative to gas. It is still true that you can save money even at gas at at 250. For me, it was more about, again, um, I, wanted, I wanted a car that I felt good about driving. I wanted a car that uh, was taking a step in the direction that I think we need to move in as, as a country. And, uh, and simultaneously, we were able to, again, make energy choices uh, around where we purchased our electricity from to, to encourage and create a marketplace for that. But all in all, we're still saving. And on that calculus, we save about 30 bucks a month in uh, gas versus electric straight up. Uh, even with the premium that we're paying on our electricity. So. And to add to that, um, the average cost of fueling an electric car in this country, and obviously it varies based on the region of the country, is about $1.25, $1.30 and, uh, per gallon, so the equivalent of that. Um, so even with today's low gasoline prices, that's still significantly cheaper than using gasoline. Um, you asked about the federal tax credit, so that's up to $7,500, so that's for a full battery electric vehicle, and even some of the plug-in hybrids will get you that much of a tax credit. Um, now, of course, it also depends on your taxes. Not everybody's going to be eligible for the full amount, depending on you know all sorts of complicated factors about your own personal tax return. But I think most people's experience is that they will get the full tax credit of $7,500, and the state rebate here in Massachusetts, and the, I know this is being broadcast elsewhere, so the state rebates and credits are on top of that. So again, in Massachusetts, it's up to $2,500, and that's just a check in the mail, so it doesn't matter about your taxes. That's just a straight up rebate. Yeah. Uh, so one quick comment and one question. I don't know how many people here know about the Google Drive Now program. You can go Drive Now. Uh, it's really awesome. You get the BMW uh, i2. It's a great option if you're going Mountain View. Pick one up at the at the airport. Actually, it's at the Sky Park. It's a one-way rental. So you know, you go to your hotel, uh, or actually, you go to campus, and then you just take the shuttle or wherever you're, you're, you're staying. It's it's like it, it's <laughs> such a wonderful experience. I really recommend it. Yeah. Can Can you say the name of it again? Drive now. It's Drive now by BMW. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, and uh, the Bay Area is the pilot city for the United States. They have uh, a lot of locations throughout Germany. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's like a rental program where you're using electric vehicles, but you don't have to pay if you work for Google. Is that what you're saying? You, you do pay, but it's a, I, I think Google gives you a little bit of, you get a, a discounted rate with Google, but it's actually very cost effective, even if you're not affiliated with, with Google. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a really great program. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the question that I have that nobody's ever been able to answer for me, I, I uh, currently I don't own a vehicle. So when we need a vehicle for something, you know, we use a car or something like that. Um, we try to get hybrids if we can, but we can't always. Um, but given that we use uh, a vehicle very infrequently, uh, but that sometimes, you know, we have an emergency and need to get somewhere quickly. My question is, if I charge the vehicle up and just sort of let it, like, sit, uh, how long does it take for the battery to drain of its charge if it's not in use? Mm -hmm. Do you want to answer that for your own experience? I, I cannot answer okay. that because I've never let it sit that long. I do, I do remember uh, thinking about that when we first, I did a little bit of searching on that that suggested there's obviously dissipation over time, but it wasn't at a at an alarming rate, but I honestly don't remember what the specifics were. Yeah, and in so. the cold weather, that would definitely be an issue. If you're just letting your car sit in freezing cold weather, um, then the battery charge is definitely gonna go down faster. So, yeah, if you, if you um, expect that you're gonna have the kind of situation where all of a sudden you're gonna need a vehicle when you weren't expecting one, um, then this might be a challenge. So let me answer that a little bit for you. Um, the, uh, I have a leaf. Um, we've left it for several weeks. And when we got back, it had the same percentage charge as when we left. Yeah. So the main traction battery doesn't, doesn't drop much Is that at all. even in the winter? Even in the winter. Really? The charge stays the same. Now, if you leave it outside and it cools down, as the battery gets cooler, it has less energy to give back. Um, it just has a little bit less capability, um, but not extremely so. It always helps if you keep it in a garage. It, it definitely keeps the battery warmer, and it just does better overall. Answer the other feature that uh, my wife and I discovered that we really liked, which is, uh, so there's a little app on Nissan Leaf where you can basically, while your car's still plugged in, uh, in the wintertime, as uh, you were just mentioning, the battery performs better when it's warmer, so basically you can tell it to start warming up the car. It'll warm up the battery and it'll warm up the car from your house or that you're all ready to go when you step out in the morning and unplug it and, and run. So that's been pretty nice to come to a warm car. Yeah. With a warm battery, importantly. Yeah. Do you have a sense of um, what the uh, overall environmental impact of these cars is yeah. if you take into account the manufacturing costs and disposal costs? Right. Yeah, it's a good question. So for those who couldn't hear, he was asking about the environmental costs of manufacturing. The battery is the biggest component of that. Um, so the, uh, the environmental impact of advanced vehicles where you do have these sophisticated batteries is definitely greater than with conventional vehicles. Um, so that is something important to look into. But um, you know, again, when we do the math and compare the full impact of conventional cars to electric cars, um, the impact is still lower for electric vehicles. Um, one thing I think that's encouraging about the batteries is that for lead acid batteries, for conventional vehicles, the recycle rate for those batteries, you know, once you sell it for the last time or turn it in wherever, um, is about 98%. So it's really high for lead acid batteries. We think it's even higher and will continue to be even higher for electric vehicles because these are very sophisticated batteries and there are and will continue to be second uses and third uses for them um, in terms of uh, energy storage. So it may not, you know, it may not work well enough for operating a vehicle, but companies can use these these batteries. Uh, for energy storage. Storage for that now. There is a small and growing market for that now. Yep. And actually, Gasoline price, the imagine gasoline price, the cars economically 
You mean how high would gasoline have to get? Like, you know, $10 a gallon, that would, like, make this a no-brainer decision for people, even if they, like, didn't care about driving electric vehicles, they just wanted to save money. Right. Well, I, I wish I can answer that question in a simple way, um, but there are so many factors involved, right? So there's the federal tax credit, there's the state credits. It sounds like you're saying even without any of the credits. There's also whether you're buying or leasing, right? And people can get very attractive monthly leases. Some people are getting under $200 a month um, for leasing cars like the LEAF, but not everyone is necessarily getting the same lease amount, everyone's paying different amounts for electricity, depending on you know what part of the country you live in, or even, as Brian said, you could choose uh, which utility program you're using. So I can't give you a great answer. I could, I could make something up or a guess, um, but I hesitate to do that. Just uh, on first principles, I think it's a really good question. Uh, you know, if I think about it from the math that I, did, that I talked to you about, just on a straight up basis, with gas at 250, we're still saving for the amount of electricity that we're saying. We're still saving money uh, at a buck and a quarter. It'd be a break even somewhere in there to be a break even. So, so it, it, I think it partly depends too on like how much would compel you to say. If I saved a hundred dollars a month, would that make me want to do it? If I saved more or not? So, and the, and the, what's that? Well, so that's what I was going to say. So actually, the leaf. So I, I, I'm happy to share this. We pay roughly thirty thousand dollars for our car, ignoring all the other things that happen there. For a, for our, in our case, it was a top end leaf, right? It had the sort of I wanted the Bose sound system in it, so so we put it in. Uh, and so you know, like I, I don't know for for most of the cars that we were looking at, we would pay around that. So maybe we paid a little bit of a premium, but not that much. I think the bigger thing that would, uh, for me anyway, that would flip the switch is. Uh, range is a, is a real issue, right? So it can't be our only car, unfortunately, because I get 80 miles on it. If you start to tell me that I can get 450 miles and I can charge it uh, pretty quickly, and suddenly it's like, and you know, now if you made that cost competitive, be fantastic, right? That's the, that, but I think for me it's, what's that? Well, so what, you want to speak to that? Because yeah, I think so it's coming. The yeah. Tesla Model S already goes, you know, 200 plus miles on a single charge, and the Tesla drivers have access to these superchargers um, in many places around the country, so that charges them up pretty fast. Um, Chevy just announced last week the Chevy Bolt that they're going to be coming out with in a couple of years, and that's going to have, we think, about a similar range to Tesla, but it's going to be much less expensive, probably somewhere around $30,000 even without tax credits and rebates. Um, so, you know, 200 plus miles, that's still not the 400. Well, yeah, yeah, Brian 250 would do it, right? It can get to Albany, New York or where, you know, yeah. there's a pretty lot of range on that. As long as you got to make sure there's chargers when you get there, but. Uh, and yeah. Nissan has said that they're going to be coming out with a longer range vehicle. So we're definitely starting to see some new exciting right. announcements. Yeah. Going back to the previous discussion about um, the price break point. Yeah. You said 30K was the car price. Did that include the charging? Station installation. So, so it didn't, no. Uh, and I paid, so there's lots of different ways you can do it. Uh, the dealers will offer you something. Uh, From a couple of years ago when I test drove, yeah. so I didn't know if those have changed or what's like. So I paid 500 bucks uh, on Amazon to buy a charger, and I paid an electrician a hundred and a quarter or so to come in and install it into my house. And so, yeah, if you got it through Nissan at the time, it was like a $2,000 thing with, yeah, right, right. So I got it for just, oh, it was just around 500, maybe a little bit over. And about a hundred and a quarter for an electrician. So, and on a two forty, and they say they were on a two forty line in that case. So, yeah. yeah. And for the Nissan Leaf, for a fully electric vehicle, it makes complete sense to have what's called a level two charger. Right. Um, if you have a plug-in hybrid like I do, you can actually just use a regular one ten outlet. So we don't have a garage, but we have a driveway. Um, we didn't have an outlet on the side of our house next to the driveway, so we had an electrician come for a couple hundred bucks, install a regular one ten outlet. Um, and we're good to go. Thank you. So eventually these batteries have to be replaced. How much does it cost to replace the batteries on the AT? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, obviously it's going to change and develop. And so I think most warranties for these batteries are around eight years. Um, and so for many people, after eight years, it'll be time for another car. Um, I think the vast majority of people will not be replacing the battery for their very car. Um, but for people who do, it's definitely going to be a significant cost. I can't uh, tell you for sure what it's going to be eight years from now, because I think battery costs are going to be lower in eight years from now than they are. Um, but 
several thousand dollars. Great question. Yeah. That was our calculus too, though. Mm. Yeah. I actually wonder about the eight-year number. Um, you know, if you think about the number of mechanical systems that aren't in the car, and why I have in the past replaced vehicles, and especially I'm, I'm considering a Tesla, which has an aluminum body. Yeah. At which point you're thinking, you know, I, I could see in eight to ten years actually replacing the battery pack on this vehicle and keep it going. It seems a little early so far to know about the longevity of electric vehicles. Do you have any any data about? Longevity of EVs versus internal combustion engines? Um, no, I mean, I think, as you said, it's too early to have any good research on that. I mean, I think we could get some information from the automakers. I don't, I don't know how much we could trust that information, because uh, they always obviously have an interest in uh, it looking one way or another. So I think it's too soon to tell. But we do have some longevity information on the hybrids, right? The Yes. Yeah, so Prius has been um, doing very well in terms of lasting long, and most people, you know, will have a Prius, a regular conventional Prius, um, for a lot longer than eight years without replacing a battery. And that's going the opposite direction in terms of complexity and number of moving parts. So that's in spite of that. Yeah. That's true. Uh, we have a hybrid thinking sort of a hybrid solution first. Um, we want to go with the electric as many as we can, but. What is the likelihood that we heard about converting hybrids into plug-ins? Mm -hmm. There are people and companies who do that. Um, I know of a guy in New Hampshire who does that for Priuses or Prii in particular. Um, there are kits you can get if you like to do this sort of thing yourself. So if you just go to Google and uh, search for uh, this sort of thing, you know, Prius. Uh, or conversion kits or plug-in electric conversion kits or if you want to find a company that will do it you'll probably find what you're looking for yes in the back uh, if you do go turtle up what do you do get it towed or or, or what uh, yeah so we're counting on AAA for us if, if that happens so what does AAA do, they, do they, can they charge on the spot or they tow it or what so uh, rumor has it AAA is starting to uh, encourage drivers to carry a charging pack where they'll give you enough juice to get somewhere um, but uh, we really hope not to avail ourselves of it but I think it's a good question otherwise I think you're gonna get towed uh, somewhere so yeah so um, Liquid fuel doesn't necessarily imply fossil fuel. So what's your opinion on alternative forms of liquid fuel that would take advantage of our existing infrastructure and cars that don't have to You mean like biofuels or hydrogen fuel cell vehicles as other examples? Well, yeah, I mean, ethanol is an easy example to come up with, but there are other ways of chemically manufacturing these things. They're energy intensive chemical processes. I don't, I'm not yeah. honest, I don't know, but I presume that these things exist. So, what's your, do you and or Sierra Club have an opinion about alternative liquid fuels that regular cars existing could run on that would not have the same biological impact, sorry, um, ecological impact as um, yeah. as crude oil? I'll say a couple things about ethanol. Um, ethanol is a very mixed bag, as you've probably heard. In some ways, it is less polluting. In other ways, there are significant environmental costs. Sometimes the land that you have to um, develop um, and the water that you have to pollute because of the ethanol production is going to have a very heavy environmental cost. Um, so I would say overall, the environmental advocacy world is not, you know, going all gangbusters promoting ethanol. Um, another thing I'll say about ethanol is that a lot of vehicles are considered flex vehicles. So you'll see that on a lot of cars, like flex fuel. The vast majority of these cars that are flex fuel capable aren't actually operating on ethanol or other kinds of alternative fuels. So it's a little bit, um, it's a whole long story, but when uh, new fuel economy standards were negotiated several years ago, it was a little bit of a giveaway to the car companies to say that they could get credit for these cars being cleaner, when in reality, most of these cars were being fueled by regular gasoline or diesel. Um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, we're definitely keeping them on our radar. Mm -hmm. um, they're not really... Uh, a viable option for most people uh, in California. They're starting to become available. They're starting to install charging stations. Um, 
But you got to get the hydrogen from somewhere. And for most people, that's from natural gas. And so whereas with electric cars, you know, yes, right now you're getting your electricity from a whole range of sources, they're getting cleaner over time because in, over time we're shifting to more renewable sources of power. If you're getting your natural gas from, or you're getting your hydrogen from natural gas, that's not exactly a clean source. You can get it from solar. Um, and there are some examples of that, and there are some electric buses, hydrogen fuel cell buses that run on hydrogen, and they get their hydrogen from solar. So that's great. Um, but it's complicated. Um, so I think we're, we're keeping these kinds of advances on our radar screen. But right now, we're most excited about promoting plug-in electric vehicles because they're available, and the technology has really evolved much faster than some of these other ones. You mentioned earlier about having businesses uh, put up the money or take the time to install charging stations at their, you know, they were, where their employers might park. Um, what's happening in Massachusetts to try to increase the number of public stations? <coughs> are we just relying on the Google, the Ikeas, or other businesses, or is there some sort of incentive and progress there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll give a couple examples. So. Um, the Massachusetts uh, Department of Energy Resources, I believe that's the agency that, that's overseeing this particular program, they have a program where they'll give grants to workplaces to offset the costs of workplace charging. So for example, I went to a, a huge office park in Wellesley, Massachusetts a few months ago where they had just installed 16 charging stations um, at their offices and they got a lot of help from the state to do that. So it's a win-win. It's a, it's a win for the company to be able to provide this benefit to their employees. It's a win for the employees who can now charge at work. Um, it's a win for the state because they have, um, they, ha they have goals they need to meet in terms of reducing their emissions. So that's a great program. Um, Google. Would fuel companies ever be requested to add overnight parking stations at their facilities? I mean, that seems like an obvious place, right? It's, it sort of would be a first come, first serve you know that you could park there overnight, like you're not gonna get barricaded in. You don't have to work for that business who pays for that space. Right? Uh, but that seems like a really an interesting avenue if people aren't already pursuing it. You mean a, um, a parking garage? I'm Sunoco. I need to say that at n percentage of my locally owned or locally, you know, wherever I deliver fuel, I'm responsible for creating alternative fueling. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah, idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know it's, if fuel companies are getting incentives to research alternative forms. It seems like a thing that would help the consumption grow. It would ease the burden on you know people if they don't want if they particularly if they live in an apartment building where mm -hmm. they can't actually ask to have someone install gas charging stations. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Um, so in terms of public charging stations, the state is also giving some grant money for public charging stations. But I think at this point, most of the money for that is being spent by businesses themselves, either because they want to incentivize their employees or their customers. You know, companies like Walgreens are starting to yeah. Uh, install them now. I've charged at the Walgreens in Beverly several have you? times. Yeah, yeah. yeah I right. think that's, that's actually true. interesting because yeah. usually when you charge your car, you want to spend more than ten minutes. I don't know if I've yeah. ever spent more than ten minutes at a yeah, Walgreens. That's right. That's right. Um, so I think it's interesting that that company in particular has yeah. installed charging stations. I think it makes more sense for, <coughs> excuse me, for a company like IKEA, where you might be spending an hour or two and you could get a significant charge. Yeah. The Nissan dealers all have uh, charging stations as mm -hmm. well, and actually. Uh, it, we've discovered that they're right near my kids' soccer fields very frequently. We'll drive out to, for uh, Lancaster, for example. There's a main soccer complex out there, and we were worried about taking the Leaf because it was one way. It was 40-some-odd uh, miles. If it was a cold day, we were a little bit worried, and, and we realized there's a Nissan dealer like right near the fields. And so we went over, and we would drive out, plug in the car, go watch the game, drive home. Great thing. So you discover them in strange places. Do you have uh, reserving time on the third stations to make sure you would have a spot? No, there there are some that are reservable. That are there are some that are first come first serve. Um, so th that's been my experience overall. One of the other things that's been actually quite nice is, uh, and the Weef owner will uh, resonate with this. There's, it's a great. Actually, you want to speak to it? Yeah, Your experience? Sure. Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah. Most of the ones in Massachusetts that are charge point on the charge point network, you can't reserve because you don't pay for them. Um, I think the laws previously were that you couldn't resell electricity. So no one was allowed to charge you for charging. I think that's changed because some of the ones at Walgreens, you actually do 
do pay to charge. Generally speaking, almost all the chargers are either at a couple of very progressive companies. Um, there's like a stop, uh, a stop and shop out, uh, out near Framingham that has like nine chargers. Yeah. You know, and, but they have a whole sole roof too. You know, they've really done a good job there. But most of the other ones are in paid parking lots, either at the airport. There are two level one and two level two chargers at one of the parking lots next door. There's about 12 cars that buy for parking there at this time. So unless you're early, you don't get to charge. Um, today I was late. I'm mean, going to have to look for charging you know, maybe at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock to get home. Um, there was two other que two questions that were asked earlier. One was the replacement cost on the battery. Um, for the LEAF, they've announced that it's, it's $5,500 plus installation. Um, I wouldn't expect to need that until at least 10 years um, based on the last two years of driving. Yeah, 20,000 miles, I've still got well over uh, between 90 and 95 percent of the capacity left on the battery. Um, and most of the drop happens the first year and then it's slower after that. So that should give you an idea on a, on a roughly $30,000 vehicle, you're talking about 15 percent, um, uh, 15, 20 percent of the cost to replace the battery. Um, there was another question about uh, if you run out. Um, I think the other manufacturers also have this, but for Nissan, there's a part of their protection plan is towing in case you run out of charge. Um, you have to work that, that. There you go. Um, to uh, get run out of charge. I and mean, once you get the idea of where you can go and get your routine going, you generally won't have that issue. Um, and you know, the, the only people that it's really hard for charging is, is apartment dwellers. Um, uh, if you're at home, you have a charging station at home. That's where you can depend on it every night. Um, at work, it's nice right now when you can get one of the spots. Um, if there were more chargers at work here, and the, the, the state plan is they'll pay half of the cost, up to $25,000, um, to install chargers, um, that would be great. Right now, we're sharing you know, four chargers uh, among a whole lot of companies around here. So getting more installed would be good. Just out of curiosity, is there anybody who is interested in pursuing the idea of Google installing some more charging stations here in Cambridge? So if so, let's talk afterwards, because, you know, I can't make any guarantees, obviously, but I can make some introductions to folks who might be able to help you make that happen. Um, I had, uh, Two comments. One, one um, is that we don't actually own the garages because they're all shared, so I don't know how much they would fly. The other one is that um, I was talking to Steve Bentner uh, the other day, and he says that there are plans to put chargers in this building in the East Garage. How many, when they're going in, I can't tell you, but there are plans to put them in this building. So. You might have noticed we're right on the red line here, and uh, we have quite a few people who don't park in these garages here, which is good because we're going to scale up. Our employees here are much faster than available parking is going to scale up. In fact, it's going to go down. Um, I, I personally happen to park at the end of the red line. And I know the MBTA, whoever they contract with there, there's a handful of parking there. But that's something you might want to put on your radar as well as these, these suburb terminal parking garages at the end of the mass transit lines. Those should be big targets for yeah. getting chargers. Are you at Alewife, that end? Yeah, me too. And so they're actually, so my experience there is they're just now at capacity. So again, early in the summer, could always find a spot. Now it's starting to get to the point where there's enough cars on the road where those, I think it's uh, six to eight spots, those fill up uh, in the morning. So. so I think we might have time for one more question or comment. Yeah. So we can talk about going like 80 miles and whatnot, but how is it in a commute that you have to sit in traffic? and get into work, even if it's only seven to 10 miles away, you're still sitting in traffic for a half an hour to an hour. How does, how does that weigh in on the battery? It's yeah. much better. Yeah, it's great. Uh, to, 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 so today I was late, I had a rush in here, yeah. and I probably used up about 50% of the battery capacity going 22 miles. That's because I was going maybe substantially faster than the recommended limit. <laughs> um, if I was, I, yeah. I could, you know, I mean, Dude, how much does it really use when you're kind of like ah, if you're not, But if you're not, if you're not when you're line. going, the best speed to go is about 20 miles an hour. <coughs> um, if you're in stop and start, it doesn't use much at all. 
if you are stopped or breaking, so if you're stopped, you're using nothing. If you're breaking, you're actually recharging and adding more miles to your battery. I, I, I have gone, just recently in the winter, I've gone uh, over 100 miles um, on the one charge just because I was careful and very slow, you know, slow, maybe five under the limit. Um, and that included some time on the turnpike. Um, so you can stretch it out if you go slow, drive easily. That's um, awesome. And that's, you know, the stop miles. and go, you just go at <coughs> even pace and it works really good. Okay. Great. Well, thank you everybody so much. It was really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kurt, for inviting us to come. Um, and I think we're going to be available to chat over lunch afterwards. So um, thanks for having us. Thanks for coming.